The presentation today starts focusing in El Salvador, which is, uh, I'm so glad that you did the introduction. I am a visual artist that has um, an unusual turn of events, um, and I have come to be an artist working in the field of human rights. So just to start this lecture, let's look at the map. And this meets perfectly what Professor Shaken was telling you in regards of um, statistics, and in this case, geography. El Salvador is the smallest country in Central America, and it is a country that has suffered an enormous amount of violence. So this uh, introduction that Professor Shaken produced today is taking us to what was happening at the beginning of the war in El Salvador. And at the beginning of the war in El Salvador, 1980 to 1992, is the time in which the north of the country is populated mostly by the FMLN, the Farabundo Martí Liberation National Front, and the south was controlled by the army. When the peace accords were signed in 1992, the Argentine forensic anthropology team was nominated to conduct an exhumation in the case of the massacre at El Mosote. Now, it is important to recognize that the massacre at El Mosote is not the only massacre in El Salvador. Actually, it is in this area of the north of Morazan, which is very small, there were 349 massacres reported. The case of El Mosote is prominent for many reasons, one of which is that there are no survivors except only one person. And the second is that from the point of view of international law, it was very important to carry on an exhumation and an investigation of this sort with only one testimony. So when the Argentine forensic anthropology team came to Morazan, in, this was in 1992, when the peace accords, after the peace accords were signed, the place had not been even visited or run over during the war. The massacre took place in December of 1981. Uh, like uh, Professor Shaking was telling us just right now, uh, when the investigation of the peace accords started, and the United Nations Truth Commission was created, it was important to identify what had happened in El Salvador during the Civil War from the point of view of the victims and also from the point of view of the Army and the FMLN. The United Nations Truth Commission had that mandate to investigate what had happened during the war. So the massacre at El Mosote is prominent, as I said, for the reasons I mentioned, and also because it is in the north of Morazan, where the majority of the massacres had taken place. So according to the testimony of the only survivor of the massacre, the Atlacatl Batillion, who is responsible of the murder of the six Jesuits, was also reportedly the, the, uh, carry on, the ones who carry on the massacre. Uh, according to the testimony of Rufina, the army came, divided the community in men, women, and children, murdered the men first, the women second, and apparently the children last. But Rufina was already in hiding when she heard the voices of her own children. Uh, and she gave testimony of hearing, but not of seeing. What the Argentine team was able to identify is that in a small building called the convent adjacent to the church, there were indeed human remains. We found 143 human remains, of whom 140, 136 belonged to children under the age of 12. So what we could conclude at the end of this investigation is that the children probably were located elsewhere and at the end of the massacre when everyone was killed, with the exception of Rufina who was in hiding. The children were taken into this small building 
and they were killed inside the building. The ballistic report indicates that there were at least 27 shooters shooting at the same time from the outside to the inside of the building. There is no ballistic evidence of any shooting produced from inside the building to the outside. So as I said, I'm a visual artist. And for me, working at the investigation of the massacre at El Mosote is probably the one most important turning point in my life as a woman, as a teacher, as an artist. Nothing was really the same after El Mosote. And I kept on making art about it, not really knowing what exactly I was looking, but something about the sifting of pigments and the finding of evidence underneath many layers was what the art was about. And I don't know if there are artists in this room, but art is very elusive. The artist only is part of the production of the art. And then art has its own voice. But for me, what was a recurring question is what else can I do? ¿Qué puedo hacer yo? What else is there to do after El Mosote? So a question that had always been present for me while working at the massacre investigation was what it would be like to come back to this place and to work in art projects with children of the same age that we are exhuming. And many years pass, but um, I did go back. We have a community of people that believe dearly that 
So this is the beginning of the School of Art in Pekin. And these are the wonderful teachers and colleagues. Um, next to me is Rosa del Carmen Argueta, the Dina, que es America Vaquerano, and Claudia Berenice Flores Escolero. So the School of Art and Open Studio of Pekin is located four kilometers north from the massacre place. For for me and for the teachers and for the communities of the north of Morazan is a great privilege to be able to work at El Mosote today with children of the same age of the ones we exhumed in 1992. But the School of Art and Open Studio of Perkin, which functions in conflict areas, has been traveling the world since 2007 and it's really interesting. We are in the north of Morazan, just as you saw the right here. You know, there is one rain and we don't have electricity for two weeks, so we cannot rely on the traditional format of communication. But somehow, the way we, we do art and the way we create community art projects uh, has been such that we have been invited to many places in the world to work in projects with people who are survivors of political violence, either survivors of torture, survivors of uh, sexual violence during the armed conflict, survivors of mm, survivors of state terror. That would be a large category. So the work we do as artists is to look at art as a possibility to learn a history that has not been yet told. And one of those projects takes us to Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, which is one of the most violent cities in the world today. So as Professor Shaken was preparing us today, we are starting from El Salvador and we are going north. We are looking at a project that was created by uh, 26 teenagers, ages 13 to 17, who are described by the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross as youth who are survivors of the effects of violence. Now, Ciudad Juarez is a place of many secrets. Um, it's the north, very north of Mexico, Ciudad Juarez is on the other side of El Paso, Texas. Interestingly, just to have a reference of geography and politics of today, 
El Paso, Texas is considered the, the safest city in the United States. Ciudad Juarez, on the other hand, which is 20, kilo, 20 minutes away, not kilometers, 20 minutes away from uh, El Paso, is considered the most violent city in Mexico and certainly one of the most violent in Latin America. What has been happening in Ciudad Juarez uh, for many years right now, but probably most prominently in the last 20 years, is the concentration of the drug cartels. And you probably may have heard the concept of narco states now having been part of the media, sadly out of the case of the 43 students from Ayotzinapa killed in Iguala, Guerrero, last year, the 26th of September. So the concept narco state has come to be quite popular. But narco state, the concept was not coined in Ayotzinapa, was coined way before, and I think sadly, El Salvador suffers the same consequences. And the reasons to arrive to this narco state, we can talk later if we have time. Um, but what it is true is that this narco state or this production and dissemination of economy based on drug, acquisition and selling has given in this area of the north of Mexico uh, a sense of impunity for crime. And one of the most prominent outcomes of this violence are the crimes against women, the femicides. So there's a new word in human rights and that is called femicides and it started in Ciudad Juarez. What it is known is that there are many cases of women that are abducted and some of them appear in the desert, some appear with revelations of um, evidence that have, the women have been brutalized, tortured before death. They are all very young and it's very difficult to even open a, a judicial case. In Spanish, una causa judicial. So if there is no opening of a judicial case, there is no investigation. How can this happen? because the authorities are perhaps not interested in learning what actually is happening, to what extent, and who is behind all this. Needs to be said, however, that this narco state happens because Ciudad Juarez sells, but because the United States buys. If narco traffic is such a prominent, affluent kind of economy, it's not only because Mexico sells, it's because the United States buys. So, um, I'm going to go fast on this. Our project then was to work with teenagers who had been affected by the effects of violence. This was uh, an invitation from the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Mexican Red Cross. When we work, when we at the School of Art in Perkin work in community art projects, we start, many of which take the form of murals, and this was going to be a mural, we begin with only one question. What is this mural going to be about? What do you want to tell in this mural? What is the story you want to tell? And the way we work in this project and in all projects is by having the participants start thinking about ideas by making drawings. So we look at the drawings, and in this case, in Ciudad Juarez, the first drawings were also very telling about what the youth was willing to say. It was a huge canvas under the Ciudad Juarez sun, which is about 120 degrees in July, but nonetheless, here we were. And uh, about 10 yards long, the first stage of a mural is to apply gesso on the canvas. And another very important part of the way we work is that all decisions are being taken by consensus, which means we all have to agree about what we are going to do, and we cannot prosper until there is agreement. That is probably the most challenging part of uh, any, any kind of project that is community-based. But when one starts 
everyone works together and the only recommendation we provide is if you have been working in any given area for more, more than 20 minutes or one half an hour, move elsewhere and try to make, uh, you know, try to visit all the mural. That is our uh, suggestion. From all the images of the mural, one that was very powerful for me as a woman, but also for what it meant to speak about this in Ciudad Juarez, is to see these two young girls, age 13, who were working on this particular image from the beginning as a team. First the drawing, then on the mural. And evidently, the woman that they painted is a woman that is a survivor of some kind of harm. And in this case, if you can look at the right of this image, you will see the pink crosses that identifies the, the women in Juarez, the disappeared women in Juarez. So when I asked the, these girls what is what they were doing, and I was not supposed to ask what they were doing because the ICRC had a lot of protocol about protecting the, the youth. But at one moment I did say, you know, what you are painting, what, you are, what I am looking at, we women learn about much, much later. And they said, well, here in Ciudad Juarez, Maestra, we learn it sooner. And that is, that, to me, that is and was at the time an enormous revelation of how youth are conflicting, are conflicted and in visitation with crisis all the time. Their way of looking at their life is in a survival mode. So what is the mural telling? The mural, not all murals, but in this case, the mural has a past, a present, and the future. The past talks about the production of cotton. I did not know this, but the production of cotton early in the 20th century was very agile. They transported, they export, Ciudad Juarez exported cotton to the United States. And from El Salvador came indigo. And that's how the factory of Levi Strauss started, creating the famous Levi's with cotton from Ciudad Juarez and indigo from El Salvador. Now that's the paradox, isn't it? Um, so the, the past also talks about people leaving Ciudad Juarez, leaving neighborhoods empty. And they, and they wanted to talk, and this was interesting in the creation of the mural. They wanted to talk, but there were some adults in the project who were teachers of other schools who didn't want to talk about it. But this, this, the participants persevered, and they did want to talk about what it means to leave Ciudad Juarez. So this figure in the middle that is not recognized as female or male is going up to a bus and probably never coming back. This is the present, the woman I told you about, surround, surrounded by elements of violence, chaining, literally chaining her to the violence of Ciudad Juarez today. The very central image of the mural is an eye that has in the middle a toddler that cannot leave. And this is how the, the youth of Ciudad Juarez feel today, that if they were to be alone or unprotected, they would probably not survive. The transit to the future is hopeful. It talks about the creation of factories that would not be maquiladoras from outside, but a factory from Mexico. And interestingly, ends with the re, uh, replanting of the cotton as being one of the possible survivors of economy. This is their view, this is the, the artist's view of how narco-traffic could stop being the only profitable industry, giving way to an industry that in the past was very profitable. This is the mural that traveled to Switzerland 
for the to accompany the 150 years anniversary of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And now the mural is traveling in the state of Chihuahua because this project was the one, the first one, that we hope to create. So the mural is our ambassador, is now traveling in the state of Chihuahua, hoping that other youth would be interested in work in such a project. And these are the wonderful artists of Ciudad Juarez. We are getting now closer to the border then. And que escribir como Dante aquí empieza el final. to work in a project in a juvenile center in the United States. We did not really know much about the journey. So to focus where we are right now, my colleagues from El Salvador and I were invited to work in this. Uh, this was the first time we were working within the criminal justice system in the United States working with unaccompanied illegal migrants, Central American youth ages 13 to 17 who are currently incarcerated in the United States. When we started talking about what this mural was going to be about, uh, very early the participant youth decided that this, the theme would be the beast, la bestia. Mm -hmm. um, they all had taken at one layer or the other of their journey, the beast. So I learned that this is a, a long, long journey that starts in the south of Mexico and ends in Ciudad Juarez or in Nogales. The youth, the Central American youth we were working with in the first project were from El Salvador, from Guatemala, from Honduras, also from Mexico, but they were mostly Salvadorians and Hondurans. Um, the juvenile center 
is divided in three parts. The youth are in low security areas, high security, and solitary confinement. So we were only working with the youth that were in low security, although I was allowed to go inside the areas of high security to work with the youth in their ideas of the project. So their ideas, although they couldn't physically come out and work on the mural, their ideas were integrated in, in, in the whole composition. So these are some images of how we work. Always, as you have probably figured out right now, the four artists from the School of Art in Perkin do not paint. We are facilitators of the works of others. So the beast, the mural of the beast, was conceived in such a way that the windows were going to tell the story. So this is the, the first to the right, tells the story of an Andurian uh, girl, age 15, who uh, in crossing the border was captured by narco-traffic and she became uh, um, a sexual slave and sold as um, a sexual slave, and she escaped from there and came to the United States. This other window talks about uh, the history. It was provided, this testimony was provided by a Mexican boy, age 16, who was mistaken by someone who had caused the death of a drug lord. And while another person was being killed, he miraculously escaped was in hiding and then eventually crossed the border. Mm, towards your right is a Salvadorian boy recognizing where he is right now within violence and what violence causes in his life, but also hoping that there will be a process towards something better. Uh, he is 14. The next uh, image to your left was painted by an Honduran boy, age 16, who is actually painting the juvenile center. So what he said is that at this point, he doesn't have any hope, he doesn't want to remember anything, and the only thing he sees is where he's at. Uh, this Madonna-like person is actually not a Christian symbol, a Catholic symbol, the 14-year-old Guatemalan boy who painted this said that he painted this because women in Guatemala today have to see their sons and daughters being killed. Um, the other image is what an Honduran boy age 16 would hope for if he ever goes back to Honduras, including having a discotheque open 24 hours a day. <laughs> And this is the entrance of a tunnel that is not dark, it's actually light because it carries hope. And this is the diptych of La Bestia, the beast, which I was surprised Professor Shaken also took it for the entrance of this presentation. The purpose of creating these murals is to make the murals travel, to have the opportunity to speak about the history of these undocumented, unaccompanied minors who are in the United States at this point incarcerated, who have a lot to say. Um, this first project was, um, was prominent for many reasons, but one of them is that we were able to enter an almost impossible world to enter, which is the criminal justice system in the United States. We were invited to create another mural this year in May, and this was also with undocumented, unaccompanied minors. What was different between last year and this year is the amount of violence that the mural depicts. Another difference is that the majority of the unaccompanied minors, female or male, are from Mexico. You know, the, the population of the juvenile center changes all the time. So the big difference is this time they were mostly Mexicans and what they were talking about was a lot more
connected to what they saw by crossing the border. So this is what they, they talk about. They talk about crossing the border either by crossing the river and seeing people drowning before getting to the other side, or this recurrent moment in which the people who are you know, leaving their countries, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, they continue to go north, 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 and when they get to the border between the United States and Mexico, what they find, and most of them didn't know they were going to find this, is narco-traffic extended. And what it happens is narco-traffic captures them and asks them for more money, which usually they don't have. So if they don't have, this is what most frequently happens. The males are forced to work to actually be the perpetrators of hideous crimes, or to be involved in the crimes, and the women are sexual, they are, they are trafficked as sexual slaves. Um, so this is quite telling, it's like looking at a documentary, people, you know, human remains being hatched, thrown into a barrel covered by acid. And interestingly then, their perspective about coming to the United States, to these crossroads, when they leave their countries, they think they are arriving, they hope to arrive to the United States for safety. The reasons for which they leave, we can talk briefly or another time, are strongly connected with poverty and they, like Professor Shakin said today, the outcome of the war and the many years after the war ended. But when they come here, if they manage to get here, they still have to deal with the legislations that apply for undocumented, in this case, minors. I also should tell you that there's a huge difference between being incarcerated as a minor or becoming 18 while they are incarcerated. If they become 18 at the time they are incarcerated, they go through a completely different channel of the criminal justice system and we lose them because it will be very hard to get them out. So the mural continues towards a hopeful part, which is the tree of life. And the participants wanted this to be the name of the mural, the tree of life that captures the possibility of a different kind of future. A future that would be allowing them to get a US passport and to decide in the best of cases what to do with their lives. At this moment, they cannot even question that because their life is contingent to many, many aspects of law that they don't know. Many of these undocumented minors crossed the border and gave themselves up because they were escaping narco-traffic. They did not know, and they still, to a certain extent, do not know, do not understand the ramifications of being part of the criminal justice system. This is another opportunity for all of us to imagine how can we, as citizens or permanent residents, as I am, can do for um, these unaccompanied minors. I told Professor Shaken that I was going to leave five minutes for question, and I am just there. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any question or any comment? Yes. Could you repeat the question? Yes, the question, if I understand correctly, is why some of the youth are in solitary confinement. They are, um, well, first of all, I have to say that I am not allowed to speak about a lot of the particulars, but what I can say is that in some instances, the unaccompanied minors, when they are uh, caught, confess to having been part of uh, crimes. 
and this is one of the reasons why they go in that section. There are some situations that are actually happening in the life of the juvenile center that have to do with um, the way in which the youth interacts and because there might be some kind of uprising of whatever, a fight or something like that, then they are secluded there. And in that case, they can go back to, uh, after a period, they can go about, back to the area of low security. Yes. Did you say assistance? Uh, no, but I do know, uh, not through their testimony, but in doing research, that is actually a place close to Ciudad Juarez, I forget the name, where there is a Catholic priest who is trying to do exactly what you are, I, I think, implying, that they provide, if nothing else, some food for the people that are coming. It's a long journey, the train does not stop. So as you see in the documentary, people go up and down of it. If they go down, they cannot go up. So they usually stay there, but it's incredibly perilous. Um, in reading more about it, what it emerges consistently is that it's a place of crime where many people are robbed, most people are robbed, most women are raped, many are killed, many are pushed away and uh, push away and then suffer the consequences of being under the train, which most of that means that they will have one leg or arms amputated. What it is important about the question you are producing is, I think, if there is not such an assistant, assistance, probably they should, and maybe that is one new way of looking at activism from the United States. What can we do for these people? And this is, you, you have not asked, but I would like to say before the lecture is over, that the problems for which people are escaping El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, Guatemala, and even Nicaragua today, are not going to be remedied with another wall or a taller one. So maybe the tilt of the question is what can we do what can we do to assist them in their transit on all when we are here? Thank you for your question. Yes. What happens to the youth that are in confinement once they become of age? Are they sent back or do we get some type of residency here? Like you know, it depends of uh, many different um, it's contingent to many different uh, decisions, one of which is uh, if, if the youth has family in the United States. Most of them do. So the juvenile center works trying to identify where this family may be located. Sometimes it's very hard because they may know that they have an and something like that. Although in most of the cases, because of age group, their own parents are in the United States. So the, the way in which the juvenile center works is trying to identify the family members and then a counselor goes to see if the family conditions are prosperous for the youth to come in because you know, it's very likely that the youth may not know at all what is the family connection there. If the family is integrated and it is safe for the youth, that the youth is reintegrated with the family. That's probably the best. In some instances, deportation is one possibility. In another form that is not deportation is called assisted return. If there's someone in their country of origin that would be responsible for the youth when the youth goes back, then someone from the United States accompanies the youth. So it is an assisted return. But in my experience so far in learning about those cases, most youth will not choose that because they are very afraid of what is there waiting for them. 
They left for poverty, for violence, gang activity, narco-traffic. So in most instances, although assisted return is an opportunity, they do not want to take it. Unfortunately, we're about out of time. I just wanted to say uh, how appreciative I am that Claudia Bernardi could be with us. She made a huge sacrifice. She's on her way to Argentina. Thank you. Thank you.